Dear beloved Thai, dear beloved brothers and sisters, and dear precious teens, I know you're here and I'm so happy and grateful. Let us sit up stably. See yourselves as mountains, stable, solid, expansive. We'll enjoy three sounds of the bell together. Enjoy breathing with the sounds of the bell. Dear family, dear precious teens, we had a lot of joy preparing for this retreat. And uh, when we were thinking about the theme of this retreat, um, one of my brothers suggested the theme, enough, enough, you are enough. It's very um, revolutionary, right? Because at your age, being teenagers, probably the last thing you think about yourself is that you are enough. Yeah. Many of us may feel quite insecure, may feel quite overwhelmed by you know, the changes in our body, all the feelings and thoughts that are racing through our head, changes in society. So we just feel overwhelmed and helpless. But to say that we are enough, that's quite radical, right? And let us explore together why, how, you can be so confident about ourselves and so that we can say, enough, I am enough. Okay. I want to write you, for you, a Chinese character. This Chinese character, it means two things. One, it means feet. And another meaning, 
it means enough. Check this out. Can somebody guess what does this stand for? Yes, go. It could, yes, it could be the mouth. Good. Okay. What's this? Oh, you are brilliant. Exactly. That's the body. What's this? The arms. Yes. What about this? The feet. Guess what? Do you get a mouth? You get a head? Do you get a body? You get arms? Do you get feet? Then you are enough. Isn't that cool? Yes. What's that, Gang? What about people who just have one arm? They can still enough, right? People who don't have feet, they still have a body, they still have arms, they still have a head. You see? So just like that, you can say confidently, I am enough because I got a body. I got arms, I got legs, I got a brain, right? Of course, that represents everything. Like this word also means feet. You got feet. So you got a trunk, body trunk, right? You have everything. And it helps us to remember that we are enough. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm only enough if I have this and I have that. And it's never enough. You know, young people don't ever feel that we have enough, that we are enough. And adults, rich people, famous people, known people, guess what? They still feel they don't have enough and they are not enough. But just this character itself is so simple. It helps us to touch the basic. What do we have? And what we have is more than enough. Okay? And when we give the names of the family, so we thought of the word, you know, you remember, got milk? Yeah? So we came up with, got milk, got rice. <laughs> right? And then we thought, got fun. Who got fun? Which family have fun? Got fun. Yeah? You got fun. What else do you, what else you got? Got soulmate. What else? Got meaning. Got dharma. Got dharma, did you say? Okay, what else? Got purpose. What else, Gang? Got each other. What else? Got joy. Got fun, right? Got Sangha. Sangha means a community like this. Right now, we got Sangha. We are all together. You see, you got a lot, right? So are you enough? Answer loudly. Are you enough? Are you more than enough? Yes. yes, exactly. So remember, okay, whenever you feel doubts about yourself, oh, I'm not enough, oh, poor me, you say, enough. Breathe, smile. I got more than enough. I got eyes that still can see. I got a mouth with all the teeth, right? One day we'll get dang, you know, we'll get crowns, we'll get root canal, we'll get implants, we'll get denture, yeah? But right now we got teeth. We got a smile, right? Yeah, we got fingers and hands that are healthy, that don't have arthritis, right? We can jump, we can dance. Wow, we got enough and we are enough. Okay. So my brother last night, Brother Peace, said it's a path and it's a radical path because it helps us to see things in a new way like that. 
And it's true, right? It's true, but we weren't aware of it. We heard otherwise, but now we know that this is a path that challenges our notions, our thoughts. You know, nowadays, young people, we get information not from books, not from formal education anymore, but we actually get information from where? Online. online. Exactly. And you know, when we get information online, we just get some statements, really brief statements, and we take them as truths, as facts. So that's unfortunate because we take them and we take them as our own views and we believe in them. Whereas in the old days, <laughs> we read books, you know, we read books and there's development, there are proofs, there's this whole exploration of how a conclusion, a story comes to be, you see? So let us also keep our minds open and learn and discover for ourselves and not just getting information online, okay? So that comes to, we can learn through meditation, we can gain power instead of feeling helpless and hopeless, instead of being victim to our own thoughts and feelings, the changes in our body and our mind, instead of being a victim to all the views, the oppositions in society, and then we feel just crashed, crumbled, squashed by all of those, you know, conflicts internally and externally, okay? So through meditation, we gain three kinds of power that I'm going to share with you today so that we see that innately we have power and that we can cultivate it so that we can empower ourselves every day, okay? So the first power I would like to share with you is the power of understanding, P-O-U, power of understanding. And how do you gain the power of understanding? One definite way is to practice meditation, okay? Meditation is known, is thought of as a bird with two wings, meditation, okay? One wing is stopping and the other wing is deep looking, okay? Two wings go together so a bird can fly. So that's meditation, okay? The one wing of meditation, stopping. We'll have a quiz at the end, okay? So let us pay attention. What are we stopping from? Can somebody share with me? Yes. Amazing. We stop all the worries, the things that are going around us that cause us a lot of stress. That's right there, an awakened one, okay? What else are we stopping from? Come. Anybody raise your hand? Yes. The devices? The devices? Using our, like, our phones. Wow! <laughs> I bow deeply. Did anybody have seizure last night? kind of withdraw from electronics? No? You slept okay? No. You couldn't sleep okay, right? You went through some withdrawal? No. no? So what happened last night? Bored. Bored? Bored. On the floor. Ah, the floor was difficult, but not the absence of electronics, right? Okay, come. Stopping. Awesome. So it means that we practice stopping. Okay. Stopping all the distractions from outside of us, like electronics, yes. And stopping all the things that also bother us inside, the worries, the fears, the anxiety, the anticipation, right? The racing thoughts, the 
strong feelings, that's what we practice stopping. Okay. And how do we practice that? Okay. How can we practice stopping? What have you learned so far? Some of the practices that can help you to, to stop your mind from running or reaching out. Okay. What's one practice? Yes. Wow, listen to that. Following your breath. Yes, Gong? Um, box breathing. Box? Yeah. How, how do you practice box breathing, Gong? So basically how it works is like, um, you imagine like a person like sitting on a box and you're like holding your breath and you breathe in and out first and you breathe out. Wow, I've never heard that one. That's very creative. Box breathing, like you uh, visualize a person running in a box. If that person is running on the horizontal line, then you breathe in. And then when that person is going up, then you breathe out. In, out, in, out. Cool. Okay. So we follow our breath, in breath, and out breath. And in that moment, the mind is with the breath. So the mind is not free to just run amok, right? Get lost in thoughts and feelings. Bring the mind back to the breath. Wonderful. What else do, have you learned to, to, to practice to help stopping the mind from running? Which other practice? Yes, Gan? Okay. Huh? Shout, shout out. Like tapping the breath can help you um, find yourself to be distracted and then like really start it. Wonderful. I'm so happy that many of you are aware of the mindful breathing. Yes, counting your breath. In breath, our breath, that's one. In breath, our breath, that's two. What did I eat this morning? Okay, come back. In breath. Out breath, that's one. <laughs> in breath, why is she talking about in breath and out breath? That's really boring. In breath, out breath, okay? So you see, the mind keeps thinking, keeps right, running like a monkey. So we just bring it back to the breath. It's like you anchor it, you anchor a boat to like this, this anchor, this pole so that the boat is not lost in the waves right, of thoughts and feelings. So you bring it back. What about the practice of walking meditation? Have you enjoyed it? Yeah? Check out this Chinese character for walking Han. Left foot, right foot. Left foot, right foot. It's no science but it's very effective. And most of the time, we are not aware of our in-breath, we're not aware of our out-breath, we are not aware that this is the left foot, that this is the right foot, right? We are aware of what's going on in the world, what's going on on you know, Facebook with our friends, and yet we abandon what we have that helps make us feel enough, that we are more than enough, okay? So the practice helps us to come back, to recognize what we have, so that we know that we are there for ourselves and that we are enough, okay? So that's the practice of stopping anything from br mindful breathing to mindful walking, mindful eating, you know, you also practice scanning the body. Like this afternoon, after lunch, we have deep relaxation. You will learn about scanning your body, relaxing your body, speaking lovingly to your body. That is stopping the mind from running and being present with ourselves, okay? And the character for mindfulness is also very telling, okay? So the first upper character like this is kim, it means now. Uh, and this is tam, it means mind or heart. Uh, 
So what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is the mind that is in the now. Okay? The heart that is in the now. Mindfulness means a now mind. Because we usually suffer from having mind and body split. There's a schism. You have heard of the, the illness called schizophrenia. Yeah? It means the mind splits. The mind is not aware of itself. The mind is not aware of the body. Body and mind are constantly apart. And so most of us actually, we, practice, we suffer from you know, a certain amount of schizophrenia, of schism, because our mind is not with our body. We are neglecting ourselves. We are rejecting ourselves. You see, so the practice of stopping helps the mind to be in the now and to come back to what we have, okay? Now, that's the first wing of meditation. What's the second wing of meditation? Yes, looking deeply. Thank you, Ka. Looking deeply. Wonderful. To use our eyes our inner eyes to look inward, to use our inner eyes to look at the world around us with wide open eyes and not through the eyes of online information. Okay? That's fed to us. That's been selected. That's very biased and skewed. And we can take side, oh, I'm on the right side, I'm on the left side, I am pro this, I'm against that. But those things we don't really understand from deep within. They are imposed upon us, okay? So deep looking is a capacity in each one of us. Huh? And how do we practice deep looking? Visualize a person on the back of a horse galloping through a museum. Do you think that person can see much? Can you see much? No, right? You just and you are done. However, if the person gets down from the horse, right, and that person stands in front of a painting or a sculpture, what do you think will happen? Aha! Uh -huh. The person will see more and will understand more. Okay. So I introduce to you this painting, and I want you to take a moment to follow your breathing. Slow down the mind. Bring the mind to a now state, okay? And then we'll listen to one sound of the bell, and we all look at this painting together. Breathe and look at it. And the longer you breathe, follow your breathing, and the longer you look at it, the more you will see from the painting. Okay? So what do you see? Raise your hands, Ka. Okay, I see two pictures opposite to each other. Okay, what else do you see? Yes. Hmm. Louder, Ka. Oh, I see the yin yang. Wonderful, Ka. What else? Give me some details. Yes. I see a boat. I see a boat. I see night and day. I see night and day. What do you see, Kang? Day and night. Okay. 
trees, right? Trees on both sides, right? Wonderful. Can you see the moon? Yeah. Yeah, you see the moon, right? What's the difference between this side and that side? Light and dark. Light and dark. Be no boat. Okay, good eyes. Besides that, are they very different from each other? No. Uh huh. They are not different from each other that much, right? There's water here, there's water there, there are trees here, there's trees here, there's the moon here, there's the moon there, there's a boat here, maybe the boat is over here. <laughs> okay, so they're not very different from each other. The only difference is the light and the absence of light. Okay? It's a yin yang being. It's telling us that in the dark, there's the light. Hmm? The white circle. In the light, there's the dark, the black circle. Huh? So they are in each other. Hmm? It's like we look at ourselves. We think, oh, I'm going to be 18. I'm going to move out of the house. One young woman actually said to me, I'm so angry at my parents. I'm going to disown them. And so I let her talk, and then I came back to it. I said to her, how do you think you're going to disown your parents? And she said, oh, I just won't talk to them. Mm -hmm. And you think it's possible to disown your parents? Do you think it's possible for your parents to disown you? <laughs> okay, go. In your body, in every cell of your body, okay, in the nucleus, 23 chromosomes are from your Oh, from your parents, from your mother and your father, right? If you don't talk to them, do you think the chromosomes in your every cell of your body will just disappear? No, they're still there, right? So you cannot ever disown your parents because they are in every cell of your body, right? And vice versa. How can your parents ever disown you? I mean... That's what people say, right? Metaphorically, but you know what? They carry you in them. All of your genes are in them, in their bodies, right? All of the memories, all of the care, all of the love and concerns. Yes, Ka? Can you disown your adopted parents? You know? <laughs> Some people do. You know, our resentment, you know, we disown our adopted parents, and yet, again, all of that love and care, all of that pain and sorrow that we cause each other, we cannot walk away from them. You see, they are still in us until we learn, okay, this is a being, a yin yang being, but it also illustrates a very deep teaching taught by the Buddha and it's called, anybody knows what's that teaching? It sounds like in, oh, somebody. Yay, how did you know about that? <laughs> did you hear me talk about it before? <gasps> okay, so, okay. It's a deep teaching on interbeing. Okay, this is in that, and that is in this. Okay? This is because that is. We are because our parents are. We are because society is. We are anxious more and more these past two years because the pandemic is. Okay? The pandemic is because of our lifestyle that has caused you know, climate change, that has caused a lot of destruction to the ecosystem. And so more and more, we will have virulent 
bacteria and viruses that can cause more problems to human beings and all other species. Can you see that? Can you see how we affect each other so much? And that is a power of understanding. When we see, when we practice meditation, stopping and deep looking, and we see this inter, the nature of interbeing, then we gain a lot of insights, a lot of understanding, okay? And I also want to introduce to you another Chinese character. Lots of Chinese characters today, okay? So this one. This Chinese character. The top one, together, it means the sign. And the bottom one, again, what does it stand for? Mind yes, mind, heart. Good. You see four chambers, the heart? Yeah? Atrium, ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. Left ventricle, right ventricle. It's pretty anatomical, right? Mind, heart. Heart. This one alone, it means sign, but with the mind beneath it, together, this character means perception. Okay? Perception. So, we look at this. Earlier, we were saying, both of them have trees, both of them have water, both of them have the moons. They're very much similar. But one is with light and the other one is without light. And so they look different, right? This is to say the same situation, the same scenario. But if our state of mind is different, then we see it all differently. You see how the sign is still the tree. The eyes, this is eyes looking at the tree. Your eyes look at the tree. But what do you see? Some people, their mind, from their mind, they say, oh, that's a beautiful tree. If they've had good experiences with trees or with that particular type of tree in general, okay? But another person who's seen a uh, lightning sh strike down a tree, or who's read about how a tree can fall down in a, in a park and squash somebody and that person die, right? And that person has fear. So when you look at the tree and you think, oh, that tree can just fall right on me and cause me, to, cause me injury or death. Do you see that? It's the state of mind that will affect what you see. Does it make sense to you? It's the same thing, my dear, same thing. And yet, our state of mind will affect our views about ourselves, views about each other, about the world, about the situation, how we will react or respond to ourselves, to each other, to the world, it all depends on our state of mind. Isn't that amazing? So that is why we practice meditation, so that we can take care of our state of mind, so that the mind can be calm, spacious, clear, open, so that we can see things as they are and not plagued by other people's views, you know, opinions are not plagued by our own anxiety, sadness, confusion, despair. You see, a clear and calm mind affects the quality of our life. A clouded, confused mind affects the quality, the outcome of our lives, okay? So let us listen to one side of the bell and breathe and just allow the mind to follow the breath. And at some point, 
you will, if your mind is with your breath, you will touch the spaciousness in your mind. It's quiet from our thoughts and feelings. It's just quiet and spacious. Come back, come back. Bring the mind back to the body. Bring the mind back to the breath. Smile, relax and release. It's okay, I'm here. I'm here for myself. I'm aware of what I have as I scan through my body, as I become aware of all the conditions that are available to me. I will go to the second kind of power. What is the first kind of power? power of understanding, okay? The second kind of power, P-O-L. Can somebody guess what it stands for? Oh, power of love, okay? Wonderful. It's the power of love. Have you heard people talking about inner child? Yeah, in clarity? We have a beautiful gate, a beautiful gate, a small one. It said, what does it say, the smaller gate? Inner child gate, right? And the larger one, it said, true self village. Excellent. What does it say on the brother side, on the monks? Huh? What does it say? The gate. Do you have names for the solidity camp? True home. home. The big one, one, what about the small one? Oh, inner child. Okay. When I was in college, I suffer a lot of depression. Well, actually, I suffer a lot of depression since I was a child. And um, both of my parents. I lost both of my parents by the time I was 12. I never really knew my father. And then when I was 12, my mother just disappeared one day. And she never came back. And eventually we believed that, you know, she was killed. So growing up with my brother, I felt very um, just lost. And even I had my mother only for 12 years, but I did not have that much of time with my mother because she left me in the countryside and she went to the city to work, you know, to earn a living, to take care of us, to take care of her mother and siblings and of her children. So I hardly knew my mother. And the very short time that I lived with my mother, She was very angry. And sometimes when, you know, like small thing, like she wanted me to finish that food, like bitter melon. Have you heard of bitter melon? Mm -hmm. Somehow it tasted so bitter to me when I was a child and I didn't want to eat it. And she would make me sit there and finish it. So out of, (laughs) just to spite her, I would sit there for three hours chewing that, you know, watermelon until like it drips (laughs) and drew on me because I just 
didn't like it, but I had to eat it, and she wouldn't allow me to stand up if I didn't finish it. So my mother could be quite verbally um, abusive, violent, and also physically violent towards me. So I, had, I held a lot of resentment and anger towards my mother. So when she disappeared, and after a week, and she didn't come back, and we couldn't find her, I actually thought to myself, I remember vividly that moment I was sitting on a toilet stall. And I thought to myself, oh good, now my mother will not come back to abuse me anymore. That was a child's thought, a 12-year-old child who had a lot of pain and confusion about her mother, about the relationship with her mother. So I thought it was a very good thing that she was gone. And then of course I grew up, I went to high school, I went to college, and I just had so many conflicts from within. A lot of problems with relationships, you know, a lot of problem with self-esteem. And just like a couple of years ago, I look at my journal, and in my journal, I actually wrote this line. I think I have all of these problems because in me, there's a wounded child. I can't believe it. <laughs> I was in college, and I wrote that. Of course, you know, when I came to this monastic life, our teacher taught about the inner child. But I didn't know, I thought of it all on my own. Even before I practiced meditation. And so now people talk about inner child. I heard that they have books on it. Actually, our teacher has a book about reconciliation, taking care of our inner child. You know, the, the title is Inner Child. And I hear people have retreats just on this topic. And you know what? An inner child, people, when we're older, we learn to sit with our inner child. We'll have a meditation, not tomorrow morning, but the next day. We will learn to sit with our inner child and to begin anew with our inner child. But people have to remember, to recall what it was like to be eight years old what it was like to be 13 years old and to be carefree, to be happy, and also to be hurt, to be sad, you know? But think of it right now. How old are you? How many of you are 13 years old? Yes, my dear, you are 13 years old. Your inner child, are you right now? Okay? Live fully so that one day you don't have to do, you know, do sitting meditation, close your eyes, and try to remember what it was like to be a 13 years old. How many of you who are 14 years old right now? Raise your hands. Wonderful, my dear. Take care of your inner child, your 14 year old inner child, okay? Because you know, with, with stopping, bringing the mind back to the body and the breath, bringing the mind back to the thoughts and feelings that you're experiencing right now, you will be able to look deeply and to understand what it's like to be a 14 years old. Okay? What about 15 years old? Yes. Be deeply in touch with your inner child who is 15 years old, okay? 16 years old, wonderful, okay? Embrace that inner child. Okay? Know exactly how your inner child is feeling, what he, she, what they are going through, okay? Because this is real time, here and now. You have your inner child. 17 years old, how precious that is. Okay. 18, 
okay, a few 18 years old. So you know adolescence doesn't start at the age of 17 or 18. Okay? Adolescence goes from the teens years, go into mid-twenties. So many changes are taking place in our bodies right now as teenagers, as an adolescent. You know, the body changes, but the mind, you know, especially in the brain. You know what happens to your brain right now? It's like trimming. The neurons that you don't use, the pathways that you don't use, they'll get clipped off, you know? They get trimmed away. Whichever neurons, pathways that you use, they, that you rehearse, they will become stronger, okay? The connection will be much stronger. So, so you learn a little bit, the neuron, that's a cell body. It has an axon, it has the dendrites, okay? That's one neuron, and it will be in contact. You know, the dendrites will be in contact with the cell body of another neuron, and then it will go like that. And they communicate with each other at the dendrites. They will release what we call neurotransmitters. Have you heard of that? Yeah, neural transmitter. Okay. So, if you use this pathway a lot, and a lot of neurotransmitters are released, okay? From a trail, it becomes a freeway, a neural pathway that is, you just think of one thought, immediately it's triggered and more neurotransmitters are released. Huh? So, if we think to ourselves, oh, I'm nobody, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, you know, I wish I can be like that girl or like that guy, I wish this and that, we rehearse that neural pathway. When I was growing up without my mother, without my father, and my grandmother was taking care of my younger brother and me, and I had many thoughts, but one of the thoughts was that I wish I could have new clothes. I just had this thing, you know? And I wish I had money. So I remember one night I had a dream and I got a hundred dollars. Somebody, you know, dropped it on the floor and I got a hundred dollars. And I was so happy in the dream. Of course, I had never seen a hundred dollar bill in my life. You know, I was growing up in Vietnam, but I had this idea in my dream. I picked up a hundred dollar bill. And I woke up, I was happy, I went through the morning, I was happy, just this feeling. And then suddenly, somewhere in the midday, I realized I don't have a hundred dollar bill in my pocket. Oh, and I felt so deflated. It was all a dream, you know? But this neural pathway was so rehearsed in me. I wish I had new clothes, at least, you know, a new set of clothes. Do you know, I went, I came to the U.S., I went to high school, I went to college, I finished medical school, I became a doctor, and then later on, I chose to be a nun. It was my choice. I had money to buy all the clothes I wanted by the time I went to college and then to medical school. But until this day, a few months, every few months, I'll have a dream. And in my dream, I will be, you know, standing in front of this mountain of clothes or this, you know, like uh, when you hang clothes on the racket. And I'll be standing there and thinking, how do I choose? Which clothes do I want? And usually in my dream, I would think, no, they don't fit me. So I, I, sometimes I realize, oh, I'm a nun. I shouldn't be wearing that. That doesn't fit me, you know? Or sometimes I just try to figure out, or I try 
do you choose clothes that are simple or white color? You see that? Whatever that we think, we rehearse so often, especially in our childhood, especially during our teen years, these neural pathways become very strong. And even later on in our lives, when we are much older, when we have changed in so many ways, these pathways are still affecting us. And that is why it's so important, my dear ones, that we learn to speak lovingly towards ourselves. Okay? Instead of saying, I'm stupid, I'm not good enough, I'm nobody, you say, no, I got I got a body, I got arms, I got feet, hmm? I got myself, I got my parents, I got at least one parent, hmm? I got a dream, I got a friend, I got life flowing in me, I am enough. So we learn to listen to ourselves lovingly. We learn to speak lovingly to ourselves. We learn to soothe and comfort ourselves instead of beating ourselves down. You see, I wish I had known that when I was your age. I didn't know. But I want so much that you know that, that you have a choice, my dear. Because whatever that we think, whatever that we say, whatever that we do, it affects the, the structure of our brain. It affects the function of our brain. It builds certain neural pathways that one time we think something or say something and do something, if we repeat that again and again, it becomes a habit. Okay, an action. You've heard of the word karma? Karma means action. Action of thoughts, actions of speech, actions of body. When they are rehearsed, repeated, they become habits. And habits become what? Habits become personality. And personality leads to destiny. Okay. So that's important. So if we have certain sadness, certain insecurity, certain anxiety, certain trauma, we learn to breathe with that, we learn to embrace it, we learn to listen deeply, speak lovingly, we learn ways so that we can take care and transform and heal that pain so that that pain, that trauma, that confusion doesn't become a habit. A habit of thinking I'm not good enough. Therefore, I will walk away from a person, from a situation before that person rejects me or before I fail. So I will walk away just to be safe. See that? So take care of our inner child here and now, right now. And we have a practice that called beginning anew. And we'll do this in two days. We practice beginning anew with ourselves. Okay? Anew with ourselves. So that the first step is to say thank you. Thank you to ourselves, like we've been learning this morning. I have eyes, thank you, eyes. I have body, thank you, body. Whether this body is short or tall, big or small, this color or that color, this gender or that gender, okay? I have a body and I'm grateful. I don't have to be like anybody else. Whoever I see that I am in this moment, I am enough. You see? Thank you. 
we learn to do beginning anew with ourselves by saying thank you to ourselves. Because often we say it to the grocery, you know, like the cashier, we say thank you to others, but we don't ever thank ourselves enough. You see? So this is to develop a new neural pathway that has gratitude towards ourselves and the conditions that are favorable for us. Okay? And we will practice this to do beginning anew with ourselves with our inner child. Yeah. And the second, and talking about saying thank you, I have a niece. She's now 10 years old. But since she was four or five, when I praised her, I say, oh, you are so smart. She'll say, thank you, Cho Cho. Cho Cho means auntie. She gave me that nickname. And I said, you know, wow, you're just so beautiful. Thank you, Cho Cho. And I said to her, you know, I'm so glad that you can accept compliment. And then she said, thank you. <laughs> it makes me so happy. A very simple thing. But many of us, when somebody praises us, you know, oh, you know, you're wonderful. No, I'm not. And there's a story. A trafficker. He was interviewed because he would go to bus stations, you know, uh, airports, and he would see a girl or a guy standing alone, and he'll come up and he'll say to the person, oh, your eyes look beautiful. And if she looks back and say, thank you, he knows, you know, okay. I don't have a chance. And he'll walk away. And he'll see another person. He'll come up and he'll say the same thing. Your eyes look beautiful. And that person looks down and say, no, they don't. And you know what the trafficker thinks? I got her. And that is how they identify victims how they know. Just by answering thank you versus no, I'm not that, I don't have that. It determines your destiny to be a free person or to be trafficked and enslaved. You see? So learn to acknowledge what you have in your daily life and say thank you to yourself. Thank you for trying. Thank you for being here. I am grateful that you are here, my dear. I know some of you were so excited about coming here because you've been here before and you love it here. But I'm also aware that there are some of you or many of you who were persuaded, who were talked into, who were forced to be here, who didn't want to come here, but still you drag yourself here. Okay? And I'm very grateful because you make that effort. So in your daily life, whatever little effort you make to care for yourself, okay, say thank you because that's important. If you are able to thank yourself, then when somebody praises you, you'll be able to say thank you. I know I have those things. I'm grateful for myself, for my life. You see? We also learn to do beginning anew by saying sorry to ourselves. Again, very few adults know how to do this. We say sorry all the time, you know. You bump into somebody, you say, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. But to be able to say that to ourselves, okay? I'm sorry. I spend too many hours on electronics. Yeah? Now I have neck pain, I have back pain, my eyes hurt, I have poor vision now. Many children nowadays have nearsightedness, severe nearsightedness, myopia. Many children nowadays develop astigmatism. The eyeball, instead of having the donut shape, 
is like elongated like a football and that worsens the myopia. Why? Because we don't go outside. The eyes aren't exposed to the sun, so the eyes don't develop normally. And also because we stare at a screen. In fact, we stare at multiple screens at the same time, right? You have your iPod, you have your television, you have your laptop. What else do you have? You are looking at multiple screens. And so your eyes, you, know, you just wear your eyes out. The eyes become very weak, okay? And having nearsightedness is bad, but not that bad. You can wear glasses. But later on, it is early myopia in your, you know, in your youth. Later on, it will lead to other problems like rectinal detachment, like mal mal macular degeneration, etc., etc., that leads to blindness. That's what you're facing. Okay? So many people nowadays have neck pain, need neck surgery, back surgery, have problem with their weight, have problem with their mental control. You know, we self-regulate. We soothe ourselves with TikToks, with YouTubes, you know, with movies of all sorts, with news, we, with games. That we self-regulate. In that moment, we can escape a little bit from the anxiety, from the homework, from the home problems, from our own feelings. But actually what we're doing is that we are rehearsing these pathways, you know, escapism, yeah? These pathways, we feed ourselves and we rehearse. And these will become habits. You just constantly think, when can I get online? When can I numb myself? When can, when can I escape myself? And right now, we're, everything is pretty much taken care of for us, right? But no, we will grow up. We'll be, you know, we'll need a job. We'll need to, you know, go to college. We'll need to have responsibilities. And there are professionals who keep thinking, you know, when can I get back to my, you know, movies? When can I get back to my glass of wine? and they become dysfunctional, you see? So know that whatever you rehearse now, every day, every moment, becomes habits, becomes your personality, and it will become your destiny. So we can blame our parents, we can blame society, but that's not going to change our lives. Then we just become victims. Or we can say, at the age of 13, I am responsible for what I bring into my eyes, what I watch. I'm responsible for what I bring into my ears, what I listen to the music, to the stories. Huh? I'm responsible for what I bring into my mouth, what I consume and what I say. You see, I'm responsible for what I do with my body. I exercise, I learn art, you know, I read, or I just sit there and veg in front of multiple screens. I am responsible for what I think. You can think negatively about yourselves, or you can say, enough. Come back to the breath. It's okay. I am enough. I have more than enough. You see? You see people, adults, they suffer and they cause so much suffering to others. Hurt people, hurt people, right? And it's easy to blame them. But if you look deeply into each person in prison, each person on the street, each person in a broken home, you will see that person had already begun to suffer as a child, as a teenager. But that person didn't know how to take care of himself, herself, of themselves. And that's why that person has become like that. Destiny has started. 
a long time ago, okay, through our habits that becomes our personality. So choose, my dear ones. You are young, but you are not too young. You are very wise. Hmm? That wisdom that you touch through stopping and deep looking, through questioning, will bring you the power of understanding, will bring you the power of love. You love this inner child. You do not become a victim because you know you can be responsible for your thought, speech, and bodily actions. Okay? And you learn to be safe to yourself. Most of us, guess what? It's not the external situation only. Even when people have guards, you know, have walls around their house, they are not safe to themselves. Many of us are not safe to ourselves. When we are lost in electronics, they have a disorder. Have you heard? I'm sure you've heard of it, right? Internet addiction disorder. And it's also called eye order disorder. Have you heard of this one before? Eye. iPod, uh, iPad, all of this eye disorder. That's internet addiction disorder. Okay? The habits that we are building each day makes us unsafe to ourselves. We don't accept ourselves. We don't face what's going on. We just, you know, look for escape. We are not familiar with ourselves. And so later on, it becomes the habit. You know, like, I'm like that. That's, that's me, but it's not us. It's our actions that cause us suffering. Actions that are beneficial versus actions that are unbeneficial, okay? So every so often, stop. Put your iPhone down. Put your iPad down. And come back and breathe. And ask yourself, how many hours have I been on screen? Huh? Am I being safe to myself? Am I taking care of myself the best way I can? Because that is love. That is learning to be safe to, be safe to ourselves here and now, okay? So that later on, we also have that good habits of putting things down, of just stopping, of just being. Huh? Last part, P-O-F. Can somebody guess the power of understanding, the power of love, and the power of freedom? Exactly. You know what? Freedom, not like freedom from political parties, from all of that. Freedom from our own habits. Hmm? As teenagers, there are all these changes in your body, in your brain. And being a rebel, being rebellious, is a part of it. You know why we become so rebellious at this age? Why? <laughs> yes. Huh? Oh, to individualize. To? To care about something. Okay. Anything else, Gong? Huh? to be more independent. Exactly. So you know, like the hormones in us, the sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen, the levels increase like by 30 times to change our bodies the way it looks, right? And also, it pushes us to, to venture outward. Uh, a doctor, Dr. Siegel, uh, Daniel Siegel, he, he came up with this acronym, ESSENCE. Okay, ES, it stands for engagement, emotional 
emotion spark, emotional sparks. So the changes in the teens, so you experience very strong emotions, passion, anger, sadness. So this, this emotional sparks, like you feel it in your body, you feel it in your mind. That's what we go through, you know. It helps us also to be more in touch with life, to be more aware of life, and not just to be, you know, like following your parents anymore. So these, the, this, these emotions that you experience because of the surge of the hormones, because of the clipping, trimming of your brain. SE, what does it stand for? Social engagement, yeah? You want to, you know, extend your circle, not just mom and dad and siblings, but you, you become very influenced by peer. You want to be accepted by peer because you are going to be more independent, right? So that's all of us. We go through this, and it can be a very healthy process, or it can be a very painful process. So if we go through it blindly, we just rebel, we push away our parents, I don't want you anymore, I just want my friends only, then we kind of miss the point as well. A tree is strong only because it has many roots, right? So you have more friends, it doesn't mean you have to cut, <laughs> you know, clip the main root, that's your parents, that's your ancestors. You can grow another main branch, um, another main root, okay, and keep them all together. What's N stand for? Novelty. That's when you take risk. Because as teenagers, you know, the brain, all of these neural pathways become so effective. It's like you have like uh, the, the, the internet power increased by 3,000 times, faster by 3,000 times. You know, refractory period is very short. It just goes like this. So your mind goes through, you know, these strong thoughts and feelings at a very high speed. And we seek pleasure. My brother also talked about yesterday, pleasure versus happiness. You want to try sex, you want to try drugs, you want to try to push, you know, try pushing boundaries. You want all of that to do that. But, so that's physiological because it, it wants to help you to be independent, right? To, 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 to venture to the unknown, to the uncertain, to go to college, to get a job, and all like that. But if we are pushed blindly, and if we don't question that, then this can put us at risk. Teenagers are at much higher risk for suicide because of these emotional sparks, so intense, right? Of leaving the home, running from the home, and being trafficked. That's from social engagement, huh? Novelty, we're at risk for car accidents, for drug overdose, you see? All of these things. So we need to be aware of that, you know, we go blindly through this reward system. We, we, we want pleasure, but we forget. Really, the deep cause for all of this is to help us to become more independent, more thoughtful, and more constructive to ourselves and to society. We don't go through this process so that we can destroy ourselves and destroy the world. You see? Hmm? So we learn and see E, the last one, it stands for creative exploration. So, you know, our creativity, innovation, all these capacities are heightened during this period. So instead of being on your electronics hour after hour, day after day, and you develop only very limited neural pathways, and you neglect the rest of your brain, which is limitless, you see? you really narrow down your choices in life. Explore, yeah? Creative exploration, learn an instrument, learn, play sport, huh? read books, learn about certain topics, subjects, 
that you're interested in. The internet, certain programs that you watch only give you a very limited view of the world, of yourself, okay? This novelty, we can choose. Coming here, that's all a novelty, isn't it? Learning all about these things. That's, this is all novelty, but it can be very instructive and constructive. You see? Social engagement, to learn to choose peer. Who love, who want to heal, who want to love ourselves, who want to care for others, you know? Yesterday, an 11-year-old boy asked me, his brother is here, his brother is 13 or 15, but he's too young for the teen camp. And he sat down with me and he asked me, can you tell me the purpose of life? <laughs> and I just, I, I just chuckle. And I asked him, I'm like, what prompted you to have this question? And he said, well, I've wanted to ask this question since I was eight. And then I, asked, I said to him, I said, so according to your understanding, what do you think is the purpose of life? And he said, well, I don't think there's a purpose to life because I see people, you know, they just destroy the ecosystem. I'm serious, these are his words. They destroy the ecosystem, they, they pollute the water, they pollute the air, they kill the animals. I think nature, uh, they, they destroy overpopulated animals, but I think nature can take care of itself. We don't have to do it. Can you believe it? So I don't think there's any purpose to life. Is that your brother gone? <laughs> Yes, that was your brother. Isn't that amazing? An 11-year-old who wanted to ask, what is the purpose of life? Practice this, my dear. That is a very deep question. So to bring it back to this, if you learn to empower yourself, okay, with the power of understanding through stopping and deep looking, to take care of your inner child. You cultivate the power of love and the power of freedom from your habits, always turn, turning on the electronics, always escaping, always talking, always doing things to distract ourselves. The moment you turn off, you push that power button off, you are free you gain the power of freedom every moment you start. Every moment you look deeply. Every moment you see that you are enough. You have the power of freedom. You have the power of making choices, the right choices, okay? Thank you, my dear ones, for being, so, being here and being so attentive. Bless you. So let us enjoy three sounds of the bell together. Okay, sit up beautifully. Last night somebody said, you know, you've had such a bad habit of, uh, you know, of sitting slouching or something with your body. It's too late. It's not too late, my dear, because you're only a teenager. So you can always learn to sit up more straight with your shoulders more open. And when you walk, you can walk slower with your body more upright. And so you change the habit. And thus, you feel more spacious and you look forward to your life, okay? Because you know you're taking good care of yourself right here and right now. Thank you. 